everyday injustice. Too many wrongful convictions, corruption has infected the criminal justice system. Leaving too many people helpless, fighting for their lives instead of receiving justice, people suffer. Is that why they say justice is blind? Hello and welcome to the Everyday Injustice Podcast. I'm your host, David Greenwald. For the past 10 years, we have operated Vanguard Court Watches in California, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Yolo counties. Our goal? Expose everyday court injustices, and now, more broadly, shine a spotlight on injustices in the entire criminal justice system in the form of wrongful convictions, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and mass incarceration. This podcast hopes to take it a step further and highlight criminal justice reform on a national level. Every day in justice. Today on Every Day in Justice, we welcome to our show Latoya Bell. She is with the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your work at the Ohio Justice and Policy Center? Sure. Ohio Justice and Policy Center, or OJPC as we affectionately call it, it started in um, 26 years ago, coming up on a 26th year, as PRAC, Prisoners' Rights Advocacy Center. And our founder, Al Gerhardstein, who is a well-known civil rights attorney here in the area, created the organization to address prisoner conditions, um, excessive abuse, things like that. And as most people know who work in any legal system, but specifically the criminal legal system, once you start addressing one problem, you just uncover more. And so probably, you know, to, in terms of continuity of addressing issues that was not only impacting the individuals inside of prison, but of course people on their way and having just law enforcement, or excuse me, legal system encounters, it expanded beyond that. And the organization became OJPC. Our three project areas are still human rights in prison, but as Second Chance became the hot issue in the mid 2000s, the organization started to do Second Chance work, which is record sealing, expungement, um, removing barriers for individuals who had criminal and legal system encounters, but maybe nece not necessarily incarceration. And from that, we expanded even more in 2019 with our Beyond Guilt Project. And our Beyond Guilt Project is, um, I often say, the antithesis of the Innocence Project. While Innocence Project focuses on exonerating wrongly convicted individuals, our Beyond Guilt Project focuses on individuals who um, a lot of people would like to ignore and disregard, people who've actually committed the offenses and accept accountability and responsibility for the actions, but are facing excessive prison sentences and being continuously denied parole and released by the parole board. And those are the two major project areas. We do a little bit of policing reform work. Um, it's not a major project area, but it is um, impactful work that we do. And what we can't move the needle on by direct representation or impact litigation, we have a policy director who is in our Columbus office who helps drive policy and legislative change. So I understand you previously worked as a public defender in Maryland and Kentucky. How'd you go from that work uh, to OJPC? Well, I am actually from Cincinnati, but I built my legal career outside in those areas. And it's the same segment of the population for me. It's just helping them from a different seat. I love my public defender experience. But there were also issues and challenges that as a public defender, you can't necessarily address. You know, you're confined to dealing with guilt and innocence of your clients. And so if you see police misconduct, the best form of action is probably a suppression issue, but that's as far as you can take it. And so after doing PD work for some time, I knew I wanted to stay connected to working with the population on these issues, but just from a different seat. I met David Singleton while I was working uh, as a public defender in Kentucky, because there were just things there that I was um, taken aback by that were happening. And I wanted to find out who was working on these issues in the area. And I Googled and I found OJPC. And after some time of knowing and being mentored by David, he offered me a job here. 
And I'm just curious, but, you know, what did you see in particular as a public defender that really rubbed you the wrong way? Well, a, a lot of the work that we do here, so the excessive sentencing, you know, um, we have not incarcerated our way out of any problem. For example, I always say I grew up during the crack epidemic, but I practiced during the heroin epidemic. And, you know, there was a shift from the early 80s and 90s from punishment to treatment. But I still see it swinging back to the punitive um, direction. And so just seeing us punish things like mental health and addiction was what I was seeing in Kentucky. And again, it's, it's a place where organizations like OGPC or the ACLU aren't active. You know, it goes, it's business as usual. And those are the things, um, the racial disparities, ex bail, you know, just all the criminal justice issues that people are constantly working on. That's what I was seeing in Kentucky. And is your work now focused primarily on Ohio or does it go broader? It is primarily in Ohio, but um, we have partnerships with national organizations like the Sentencing Project. And so we have opportunities to collaborate um, on a national level, maybe through our Ohio lens. And from time to time, our former executive director has taken cases outside of Ohio. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of your work now focuses on, on second chance. And to me, you know, it seems like, um, you know, with a lot of the focus, you know, for, for a long time, it seemed like progress was being made on criminal justice reform in general. And then kind of during the pandemic, as crime rate, uh, you know, ticked back up, people started getting scared again. But to me, at least, it seems that second chance should be something that everybody should be in favor of, because what we're doing right now just doesn't work. Uh, we put people in cages uh, for a specified period of time, 95% of them are going to get out at some point, and then we make it impossible for them to get their lives back in order. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I agree. I think one of the things we can do in terms of people working on reform is change the narrative and the lens, you know, engage people in conversation because second chance isn't just a criminal legal reform issue. It's an economic issue. And we should have learned that during the pandemic and getting out of the pandemic. I can name several industries that were impacted hard by it. And I'm sure there would have been business and institutions that didn't fold if there were individuals who weren't limited to re-entering the workplace because of a record in um, education. We didn't have enough teachers. And maybe if you weren't barred from teaching by a criminal record that had nothing to do with performing your role as a teacher, you know, maybe we'd have been in a different place when, during the pandemic, the same with the nursing industry. And so I think engaging people in conversations like this to maybe change how they see the work we're doing, because it's not just a criminal legal reform issue, it's an economic issue. And we all do better when everybody has an opportunity to work and gain full employment. Yeah, it just seems like, you know, the two best ways to get people out of the system entirely are A, give them a job and B, give them education. And yet we're not doing either one very well. The other thing is housing. I think it's very, very easy to overlook that the criminal, the impact that a criminal record has on housing. And I, I've seen it go like very quickly from an individual just charged with an offense, not found guilty, their subsidy terminated. So then they're evicted. And in a matter of days, they're in a shelter for a case that if they're actually found out guilty of, they've already experienced um, being unhoused. And, and there's no, I'm sorry, they cannot do that. You know, they're already in another crisis now. And so housing is another one of those things where, again, if we want to say that um, we care about recidivism, then basic necessities like education, job, and housing shouldn't be such a barrier, especially for outdated criminal records. Yeah, we were just covering um, this case where a person had, you know, conv uh, been convicted of a crime, they pled out, and uh, they were put under supervision. And one of the terms of supervision was an ankle monitor. Um, but they were unhoused. And so 
what happened was, as you can imagine, their ankle monitor ran out of battery. They didn't have a ready place to charge it. Um, and so they end up getting violated. And uh, because they were unhoused, that became rationale for the judge to then put them back into custody. So now, um, you know, it, it becomes this crazy cycle where, you know, they were trying to follow uh, the guidelines, but, you know, their situation made it hard and the judge was just completely unforgiving. It happens time and time again. Um, sex offenders is top of mind because it's the segment of the population that makes people uncomfortable and uneasy to talk about and think about. But one of their conditions of release is going to be registering and you have to have an address and no one wants to rent to someone with a sex offense. So I'm already behind the eight ball before I'm even released. I'm already set up to fail because the list of people who are going to rent to me is small if, if it exists at all. And I have to have a place to live to stay released. And so, you know, it, having these conditions just really, it doesn't justify um, the end result for reentry because it's, it's not helping them get a fair chance at reentry. The aging population, you have individuals who've been incarcerated for 30, 40 years, there was no internet when they went in. And so all of their reporting conditions and how they live their life is going to be automated. And there aren't many programs <laughs> in institutions that help them acclimate to a now digitized society. And so you're gonna to have to report, get your medication, sign up for benefits on a kiosk or on a computer, and you don't know what this, <laughs> this instrument is. And so have we really set them up to successfully reintegrate now? And I think a lot of people only see this issue from one side. They see this, oh, you know, you're, you're trying to, help people that, you know, used to be in prison, but they don't see the other half of this, which is this is a public safety issue because what happens is people get released and then uh, when you set them up to fail, they commit a new crime. And what does the new crime do? Well, it puts the public at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this isn't just a humanitarian position, which I fully you know, appreciate uh, and, and think that we need to take into account, but it's also a public safety issue and nobody seems to grasp that. We use the term, especially at election time, public safety is just this buzzword. It's uh, what lawyers call a term of art, but what exactly does that mean? We are releasing individuals you know, who may be subjected to committing new offenses to survive, you know, um, but also it's not even individuals who commit a new offense. If we're releasing somebody who has mental health needs, but not with a solid mental health plan, and then they start experiencing an active mental health crisis, we've criminalized mental health because you can't be mentally ill and out on the streets and unhoused because then you're going to get arrested for disorderly conduct because you're off your meds. And so again, it is, it's not just a humanity issue, issue. it's the logic, it's, it's common sense. How can we release somebody or we release somebody with no access to mental health medication or therapy um, resources, but we also don't want them out in the streets. Where else are they gonna go? Um, and then we rearrest them only to, to keep the cycle going again. So what do you guys hope to do about this? Because, you know, I think, I think when people actually start thinking about this, obviously, you know, they're going to kind of see it differently. But what do you see as kind of the evidence based approaches that will solve this problem? I think a couple of things um, and each project may lend itself to it as it regards to um, beyond, beyond guilt. One of the things that we're talking about is just resensing reform because there is no correlation between longer sentences and reduced crime. We, we know that. Um, and so again, have we combated any social ill or addressed any real problems and by imposing lengthy sentences, we have not. Criminalizing things such as mental health and poverty 
doesn't fix mental health and poverty. It only creates more mental health and, and poverty conditions. And so a lot of what we are hoping to do is maybe make legislative changes, you know, and into what, into sentencing. Ohio flip-flops back and forth from definite to indefinite, which also creates um, a challenge and, and disparities. And so going back to something else you mentioned with second chance, um, there's relief, but effective relief. Second chance is great if it's effective, but here in Ohio, to apply for record sealing, you have to proactively go to the court and petition to have your record expunged and sealed, even if it's a non-dismissal, a non-conviction, a dismissal or acquittal. So this requires individuals to take time from work, if they're working, um, to go to court to have something that if it was just done automatically on petition, more efficient, you know, more sealed records without people missing work or taking time off work, which a lot of times put them at risk for losing their job because they have to, you know, choose, do I go to court and file this petition or just keep this on my record? And so what we're pushing for is more effective uh, legislation that is actually substantive relief and not just practical, but in theory, but falls flat in execution. Yeah, I think you raise a good point. Um, one thing that I learned, I was a, a foster parent and I had to uh, go and access a whole bunch of services, which, you know, you, you don't really think about uh, normally. And what what really struck me was I was having to sit around the county office for hours waiting for somebody to be able to come and, and uh, get me set up. And I'm like, how would somebody who's on an hourly job have the time to access these services. And yet it's that population that are uh, most in need of getting those services. And it's not just, you know, that kind of service, it's mental health services, it's getting medical treatment. If you don't have medical insurance and you have to sit around the clinic for hours waiting to uh, for your turn to be taken and, you know, we, we just create this whole litany of things that people have to jump through in order to access services. And these are the same people that are really living on the margins to begin with, and their jobs are vulnerable. Right, right. As a public defender, individuals would have minor traffic offenses. Um, and again, it's not always an issue of just a blatant disregard for the law. A lot of traffic offenses are issues of poverty. I didn't renew my license because I don't have the money to do so if I'm working minimum wage jobs or um, not working at all. I worked as a public defender in small counties, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, where there was no driver's ed in school. And so individuals have to pay for the driver's ed course, which was expensive, was six to 800 bucks. And then you have to hold your temps for nine months before you can apply for a license. So that's nine months that I don't actually have a license. So for a lot of people, it was easier to drive without a license to jobs um, that they needed for survival. And so you get a driving without a license charge. And then, you know, it didn't make sense to a lot of judges, but if you're in crisis mode and day-to-day -day mode, most people would choose to go to work than go to court. So they missed a court date and now they have a failure to appear. And so again, it's just, a lot of people who are already underserviced and under-resourced making these day-to-day -day life decisions, which ultimately forced them to create consequences that they didn't anticipate being greater. Yeah, um, and, and and that gets into this whole other realm of, you know, the fines and fees and all these fees that get imposed on people in the system. I was just explaining to our interns uh, you know, just how pervasive uh, that system is. And again, you know, it, it's something that I think the typical person, um, you know, who who's in the middle class doesn't really think about, you know, I, I mean, think about a speeding ticket, you know, $400, really painful thing for me, but, you know, it's not, it's not life threatening. Uh, but for people that are living on the margins, 
a four hundred dollar fine for speeding is is, is life altering. Yeah, and again, the insurance. If you don't keep adequate insurance, the remedy is to make you pay. Um, it's called SR twenty two here, which is a more excessive insurance liability coverage. So if if I could afford the cheaper one, I would. And your result or your your punishment to teach me a lesson is to make me pay an even excessive more amount of coverage. And again, it's not an issue usually of blatant disregard for the law. It's usually an issue of poverty and finances. So I want to shift gears slightly because uh, you mentioned, you know, a lot of your work on excessive pr prison sentences. And you also mentioned partnering with organizations like the Sentencing Project. And, you know, the Sentencing Project has really, in my opinion, uh, laid out, you know, the absurdity of uh, a lot of these excessive sentences that we now know that people age out of crime. And so not everybody. I mean, we have like a, a mass killing out here in California by a 72 year old, but that's pretty rare. Um, you know, most of your serious crime are, are, are done by kids, um, you know, literally kids and, uh, you know, basically mentally kids, people under the age of 25. And by the time they get to my age, most people have aged out of crime. Um, and yet the way we set up our sentencing laws is that um, the more times that you commit a crime or crimes over time, the longer your sentence is going to be until the point, and this is really the absurdity, the point at which you're about to age out of crime is when you get sentenced to that life sentence. And, and so then, you know, it becomes this economics issue that we're we're spending huge amounts of money to take care of people that aren't going to commit crimes and we're paying for their substandard medical care and, and locking them in a cage for the rest of their lives and doesn't make any sense. That So that is, in essence, part of how our Beyond Guild project became to existence. Um, and in going through some of our clients for this year, and assessing whether we could accept them or not. There were two individuals who I did accept because there is this pattern, this 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 aging population who've been incarcerated for 20, 30 years with no evidence of recidivism. Physically, a lot of them can't because their health has deteriorated by being incarcerated for so long and the, the quality of health care and just life in, in prison um, hasn't been. <laughs> sufficient. And again, they haven't been able to pay in social safety nets. And so we've essentially been housing them longer and, and at rates that's more expensive than what it would be if they were on the streets receiving subsidies and state health care. And, and the hoops that we have to jump through to convince the parole board of suitability for release, it's, it's astonishing at times. Um, individuals with mental health diagnosis who pose no more risk than individuals who don't. Um, because again, there are individuals with the same diagnosis as some of our clients who are outside and contributing and working day to day. And so those things tend to get used against them. It's not directly stated, but you can tell, you know, the things that have been used to deny them parole and release. Um, and so one of the things that has been taken across across the nation in terms of resentencing and sentencing reform is um, elder um, compassion, re compassionate relief for the elderly, because you're talking about a population who poses the least risk of recidivism. Um, on the opposite end, our Beyond Guild also helped to um, solidify the need for addressing juvenile sentence as an adult. You know, they have the courts and legislation to have finally come around to recognize science as important factor in, in, in sentencing. And so individuals committing crimes under 18, factors like peer pressure, brain development, impulsivity are now being factored, uh, considered at these hearings. And so we sentenced this 18 year old to 50 years and now they get parole hearings and realize, oh, we probably should have at the time of sentencing considered impulsivity. Their, their family life, their structure, mental health, 
brain development because a person at 16 and what they committed and what they did, their actions, they're not the same person at 30, but they're continuing to be housed and treated as such. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because I I meet a lot of people that are incarcerated. They're in their 30s and 40s. And, and and they're not the same people that they were when they were, you know, 16, 18, and they committed the crimes. And some of them committed bad crimes. Let, you know, we're, let, let, let's not whitewash that. But these aren't the same people. A lot of them have gone back. They've gotten their education. They've dealt with some of their childhood traumas. Um, and, and they're they're ready. They're ready to get out, um, you know. Out here in California, we now have some look back mechanisms and some resentencing. Uh, what is available in Ohio for people in those situations? So Senate Bill 256 is the legislation that has that allows individuals who were previously sentenced um, as juveniles to the adult system for, to life without parole. Now they have an option of parole. And so that's one of the mechanisms and one of our, our pushes for policy reform on sentencing under second look could be um, prosecuted, prosecutorial initiated resentencing, um, some look back statutes. There's nothing currently on the books, but that is things that are things that we are working on. 256 is what, the best thing we have at the moment. And again, that's for the juvenile individuals who were sentenced as juvenile. So we still have work to do. So do you guys primarily uh, deal with policy advocacy, or are you also dealing with directly representing people uh, that are in need of resentencing? Both. So under Beyond Guilt, all of our programs, we will directly represent individuals. We do impact litigation, and so we do have some some, leg some litigation pending about parole um, for individuals who we represented at hearings. Um, and then again, when we can't move the needle or if there are things that aren't appropriate to address before the parole board because you don't want, you know, the client to be flopped because of your argument, you make, you're making legal arguments. Those are things that we try to push through our legislative uh, policy work. Now, in terms of you personally, which area do you handle? So I've had my, hand, my fair share of second chance clients and beyond guilt clients. The only project I haven't had a case from is human rights in prison. Um, and that's just because sometimes our what comes in isn't actionable just yet. Um, and with all of our work, you create, an, there's a need and it's overwhelming. So we started Beyond Guilt. It was uh, one or two cases. And now we're up to over 2,400 inquiries, just people who've written into us. We have an active caseload of 80. I've just personally had two clients be determined suitable for release after a hearing in May and July. So I've touched all the projects with the exception of human rights in prison. So let me ask you, um, you know, looking forward, are you hopeful or are you pessimistic? <laughs> I, I want to be hopeful. And I, and I did an interview yesterday and I said, you know, it, it's discouraging at times. And they said, why? And I said, for as many people as we get released, there's just a few more cycling back in. Um, you know, it is a system. And by design, it is going to operate and function as such. It's not perfect. It's the system we have, you know, but the challenge is you can't pause the criminal legal system to fix all the issues. You know, you, it's, you have to work and fix it while you're in it. So maybe I'm hopelessly optimistic. I don't know. <laughs> Do you feel more like the person with the finger in the dike, or do you feel more like Sisyphus? It depends on the day. <laughs> depends on the day, the judge, and the client. <laughs> I hear you. I, you know, I don't know. I was really hopeful, and then I became really pessimistic after the pandemic um, because it seemed, it felt like we were making progress. It felt like, um, you know, people were starting to understand things and then it felt like all of a sudden everything backslid. Yeah, the, the pandemic definitely took the lid off of so many things. Um, I'm going to say I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. And, and I say that because we're having conversations like this. Um, I, I have gotten 
and our organization has had some wins, individual wins and, and policy wins, collective wins. And, and I can remember a period of time where there was no OJPC. And so the fact that there is an organization here in my city when I grew up and there was a need, but no organization, the fact we're having these conversations and, and we're getting, you're using your platform to spread the word um, outside of, about Ohio and California and around the, the, the U.S., I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because there was a period of time where these conversations weren't happening and this work wasn't being done. And let me ask you uh, about that as well uh, as we're about to wrap up. But, you know, Ohio is kind of an interesting state, at least from my perspective. Uh, you know, are, does it feel like the state is receptive toward uh, these kinds of ideas or or do you feel like you're pushing against an immovable force? The unique thing about Ohio that I've, I've realized, and I didn't pay this much attention growing up here, is because it's not a unified court state, you know, it's going to vary from county to county. And so, you know, I feel like there are areas where progress is made in other counties outside of where we are, and we're still playing catch up. Um, but overall, I feel like there's progress because, again, growing up here, I couldn't imagine there ever being an OJPC and this work being done. And so there's progress being made. And I don't want to seem completely cynical, but yeah, there's progress being made. And if people want to learn more about OJPC, how can they do that? We are on the web, www.ohiojpc.org. But I'm also aware that the population that we have don't always have access to the internet. And so our phone number 513-421-1108. Well, thank you, Latoya, for coming on and, and sharing uh, your amazing work. Thanks so much for having me. We really appreciate you taking your time to, to learn more about us and spread the work we're doing. This has been Everyday Injustice. I'm your host, David Greenwald. Join us again next time for more tales from the injustice system. Thank you to George Powell and Norman Mouse Quake Barrett for the use of our opening Everyday Injustice. You can see more of George's music at www.justiceforgeorgepowell.com. That's justiceforgeorgepowell, all one word, dot com.